Hey, everybody. That is Gary Smith. Hello. That is Kaz Kenny. Kapow! And I am Eddie Bramlin. This is episode 49. 49. 49 of the Black 49. 49. 49. One more with the big 5 0, baby. That's it. So, so start us off this week's fishing report. I got to tell you what, fishing has really sucked. No, not in February. It's not because it's cold. It's not because there's ice in <laughs> the water. It's not because the water's 32 degrees. <laughs> been tough, folks. So, uh, fishing-wise, it's been blue cats most places. Marshy Hope, if you've been watching Cornflower with that big blue cat life.com, uh, you can see all his shenanigans he's got going on over there 24 hours a day because he doesn't sleep, and that's all he does is go fishing. Uh, so, we know blue cats are over there in Marshy Hope. We know we're catching plenty of blue cats in the Nanakook. Um... I'm hearing some yellow perch in the Anacoke. There's a lot of yellow perch in the Anacoke. You know, they're in there. They're just waiting to go. Uh, the Marshy Hope's got quite a few yellow perch in it, too. Uh, the Upper Chop Tank's got quite a few yellow perch up in there, too. Uh, so we're just waiting for the temperatures to get right and for them to start breaking loose. Uh, white perch. The white perch are staged outside the mouths of most of the rivers here on the eastern shore, uh, especially down in Fishing Bay and places like that out in the Honga River. You know, these white, white perch are getting ready to take a run here. If you're out and you do get a warm day and you can get out in the water and you find some deep holes, Tear them up. Uh, you can get down to them white perch with a, a tandem jig, you know, or two, two jigs and a little weight on the bottom and just bounce that off the bottom real slow and just watch your fish finder. You should be able to pick up some nice, nice perch. Some of the white perch that I've been seeing coming in here are 13, 14 inches. So there's some big stuff out there. There's some slabs, yeah. Oh, God. And then uh, Smithville Lake, I'm hearing there's a few panfish being caught up there, um, pickerel, a few bass, uh, spillway. Uh, if you take your gig with you, you might be able to get a snakehead or two up there after dark, so uh, check that out. Uh, Severn River, I'm talking to some folks up there. It's pickerel and yellow perch, a few white perch here around and about. That's about the same place everywhere else. Magathy River, same thing, pickerel, yellow perch up there. Uh, the reservoirs, Lock Raven, all them places, everybody I'm talking to, it's crappy. It's uh, some yellow perch, a few bass, and a lot of pickerel. So that's really good to see. I also know that uh, my cousin JR got his muskie off his bucket list. So congratulations on that there, JR. Glad to see you got that done. Uh, what else we got? Uh, Conowingo Lake above the dam up at Peach Bottom. They're catching some really nice walleye, some striped bass, um, quite a few muskies. Uh, I got a friend who's caught three here in the last couple weeks, uh, some big ones too. Uh, Lower Susquehanna, it's yellow perch, it's a uh, walleye, it's a uh, crappy, it's a uh, blue cats everywhere, flatheads, a little bit of everything. So you just don't know what you're going to catch out there in that deep water, especially on the backside of the island down there. So I uh, know them guys are catching some yellow perch and stuff like that. A lot of the marinas there, you know, they're catching yellow perch, catching bass, catching a few things in the Lower Susquehanna River, stuff like that, you know. Um, before I forget, last week, you know, we had Nobody that, got we, it. We had that. We had that rod that could have gone up. And uh, Gary's got that in his hand right here. So uh, if you know Matt Fletcher's PB, his biggest snakehead he's ever caught. Nobody correctly guessed nope, it. Last nobody week. guessed it. So uh, no, if you know it, it, you can't play. If you don't, yeah. Play, if you know it, you it. can't play, and you're not going to win. <laughs> but if you don't know it, and and you guess it right, then uh, you can win this rod for free. That's a nice rod. That and is a nice rod. Beautiful rod. 180 dollar rod. 200 dollar rod. You know what I mean? So. Can't beat that. That was all nice... you had to do was know it out of the <laughs> that, that was a nice donation from Matt. You know what yeah, I mean? We didn't expect nice. that comment. And I'll tell you what, these are really, really quality uh, stuff. I mean, the wraps he's got on these things, the eyes, I mean, the stoutness of these rods. I mean, I might take that thing over Gary's tomorrow and go try that on some bluegills, see what happens. You never know, you know? <laughs> see how good that thing really is. So, I mean, that's about where we are with the fishing report everywhere. You know, it's same thing you don't know if you don't go. You know, that's what I tell everybody. Are they biting here? I'm not going to tell you. Come down and find out. You know, they're, they, if you search far enough, long enough, you're going to find what you're looking for, you know? So, um, Bait is the answer right now. Bait, bait, bait. So mm -hmm. make sure you get a hold of Damien and Cornflower over there at the Bait Boys. If you guys need minnows, grass, shrimp, anything like that, uh, we've got plenty of it coming in for stock. Um, that's about what I got on the fishing report. Um, we've got the nobody's guessed the fishing rod, so you uh, can still you still got opportunity to get that. That's a good deal. You better tell them out again. Tell them out again. Maybe yeah, let's show them again. Show so, them again. so look, so here's the thing. We still got this rod up for the giveaway, okay? Yes. All you have to do is guess Matt Fletcher's personal best on Snakehead, okay? And keep in mind that we're going to be offering the uh, the limited edition snake skin wrapped yep. rods here at the Wolford store. Uh, if you want to order any of them, you can get a hold of us here at the store, and uh, Eddie can get them you know, ordered for you, or you can get a hold of Matt, and we'll get them ordered in for you. Yep, so. Matt's working on them. So you that it? That's about it. It's man, that that is, that's a quick fishing report, was man. Was it really, man? That's, four minutes? We're only four minutes in. Do you want to make thing, some more? Man. I can make some stories up. No, we don't need okay. no stories. But. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> we got a good show today, I'll tell you that. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of good stuff to talk about. And then we're going to talk about tournaments. We're going to talk about snakeheads. We're going to talk about the CCA, baby. CCA. That's what it's all about. Speaking of CCA, hmm. this week we've got Dave Skorsky on here from CCA. How you doing, Dave? I'm doing well, gentlemen. Big Thanks Dave, what's up, buddy? <laughs> what's up is uh, four, maybe five inches of snow outside my window in Baltimore. So. Not fun. Not fun. We don't have anything here if you want to come down here and hang out. We still got grass and blacktop. <laughs> <laughs> Dead grass. <laughs> I think, it might be snowing now. 
I think last time I saw you guys all together was what back in May or so. Last time we did a podcast, I know I left my boots at Gary's house and the cooler. So <laughs> it's been a hot. I minute. do need to make it down there. I have driven by a couple times throughout the hunting season, and I felt guilty I didn't take the time to catch up. But, I've only uh, loaned him out a couple times, man. There's, there's <laughs> I told you that was him driving by, and we should have been throwing rocks, Eddie. Yeah, rubber, rubber when it sits for a long time gets kind of stiff, so you gotta you gotta work it every once. That's in a right. While. You can't let him go stale for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, you can't imagine how many times I walked around my garage looking for those boots. And I went, you know, what, where did I leave them? I leave stuff all over I'm the sorry, place. man. I forgot to tell you. That they were, I think I told you one time. Yeah, you probably did. You know, it is what it is. But I, I, Kaz, I love that fishing report. You know, when we were talking before, I forgot to mention that CCA has had a uh, our Pickerel Championship tournament running since December 1st. It ends on February 28th. And uh, it's a three-fish stringer event, and there's different categories and stuff. This year, we have 80 people uh, participating. It's all based in, on iAngler. And uh, there's 308 fish submitted so far. Uh, the, the biggest pickerel is a 27-and-a-quarter-incher, and I know that was caught in an impoundment on the eastern shore somewhere. Um, the biggest yellow perch is a 13-and-a-half-incher, and the biggest crappie right now is 14-and-a-quarter. I better go fishing. Uh, <laughs> yep. So... <laughs> There's some uh, there's some top notch anglers catching some big fish and we've got really cool prizes coming up so you know folks are in that thank you for participating you can still sign up technically it's it's uh it's open until the uh, the 28th and um, so folks could sign up and get out there fishing and still compete for some good prizes we've got really cool trophies on the way for this one um, I, so. I, I'll tell you what you're doing just an amazing job with this whole invasive thing that you guys are doing Dave I, I can't thank you enough and I think this really opened up a big world to the angler now. You know, being that, that we can see where some of the stuff's being caught and some of the things that they're using, and you know, it, it's building, it's building, it's building the community. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think yeah, exactly what we talked about last year with the great uh, Chesapeake Invasives Count. It's an event we kicked off last June first, and I'm really proud to say that uh, it was a success last year. We gave away lots of prizes for folks to participate. Uh, we couldn't do it without I Angler Tournament, and uh, behind I Angler is the Angler Action Foundation. And if folks check out Angler Action uh, Foundation on, online, I think it's angleraction.org or angleractionfoundation.org. What, what, is, the, what, what is the Angler Action Foundation? Tell us a little about it. So they're an organization you know, with the same mindset that you guys have, the same mindset that CCA has. It's about anglers being informed and educated, helping make a, make a positive difference in the future. Um, the executive director of Angler Action is my good friend, Brett Fitzgerald. I had him on, a, on one of our What's on the Line podcasts in CCA a while back. They're actually on our website, ccamd.org slash podcast. So if folks want to listen to that, I think it's episode nine or 10 or something. Um, Brett is a great guy, just an obsessed angler who goes fishing at every minute he can. I mean, he's a professional uh, speech pathologist in his full-time job, but That's also cool. works part, yeah, part-time for the, for the Angler Action Foundation. And really the core of, of the work they've done uh, started back in, uh, gosh, I think it was a really cold freeze in Florida that killed a lot of fish. And managers had no no way to understand um, what was happening in the fishery quickly because fisheries management is always a slow process. It takes a while with all the data, and it's always kind of looking backwards. Well, the, the Florida managers needed really good information, so what better way than to connect with the anglers who are out there on the water observing what's happening? So that's when the iAngler app was developed, um, and it was developed to help managers understand where, how many snook were out there, how many redfish, how many trout because so many fish had died in the cold stun, the last thing managers and anglers wanted to see happen was, you know, these populations really be impacted. So they all came together, they captured some data, and what they were able to do was really get a good picture of what's happening on the water. Um, and, and it ended up opening seasons more quickly because managers didn't have to rely on old and long, you know, these massive data sets that take a while to process. They were getting information directly from anglers. So that's really the, the basis of iAngler and, and the Angler Action Foundation, and it's why we have the tool available in the iAngler Tournament app to run fishing tournaments, which are fun and, you know, great competition. But behind that, we collect data, and that, that is really the foundation of the Great Chesapeake Invasives Count. I've been fortunate enough to be on the Sport Fish Advisory Commission. Um, I now chair a, a committee of that that focuses on tidal and coastal issues. Uh, we, we try and bring recreational anglers together to advise Maryland DNR on how to manage our fisheries. And after more than a decade now of sitting into fisheries conversations, you realize data and science drives everything. Mm -hmm. Anecdotal information and what's happening on the water is really important, too. Uh, quite often, folks feel like they aren't listened to. And that's a big part of my job is making sure that anglers' voices are heard. Um, 
but the reality is you got to have data to do science-based management. And I know you guys have talked a lot about the great work that folks like Joe Love and, and various partners in Fish and Wildlife and, and within Maryland DNR are doing to try and understand the impacts of the snakeheads. Well, they don't have a dedicated invasive species program in Maryland DNR. They don't. They can't do. afford it. Yep. You know? and, and that's the problem they're running into, like you're saying, is, is just the data collection. I mean, you, you, it takes so long to collect the, the data for the scientific research to, to base your policies on. It just takes forever yeah. to, to get anything done. By the time you get it done, it's changed anyway. Yeah, exactly. Now, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to, to blow the whistle on something, but we're working with an organization in the Upper Bay right now to put a program together with them to where their students, you know, when they're there on their weekly tours, uh, they're going to have, we're going to put in place and uh, they're, they're, they're going to catch the snakeheads. We're going to teach them how to set nets there. Uh, and then we're going to let the kids, you know, gut sample the fish and, and dissect the fish basically and, and teach them about the snakeheads at this organization. Uh, it, it is a nonprofit organization in the Upper Bay. And once everything is, is through there, then I will go ahead and announce the name and let everybody know what's going on with that. But we're also looking to get permits uh, to do some studying at this location also outside and away from you know, the, 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 the stream side, you know, we want to get in the lab, put some in a tank, do some, do some color options and some things like that. And I told them that I would help them with that, you know? So, um, we want to try to look at, you know, the, the, the intelligence of the fish. We want to look at, you know, the growth of the fish in the upper bay. We want to do scale sampling. We want to do gut sampling. We want to do all that. And we figured that with the amount of kids that are coming through this program, this would be an easy way for us to gather, you know, a couple hundred, maybe another couple thousand gut checks a year. You know right, what I mean? Right. And yep. where, and where yep. this place is located on the flats, it's just a perfect place for us to do this, you know, and, and they are on board 100% and they want to do something too. So I'm really looking forward to getting you involved with that on this end with us on that program too. So a lot of good stuff Absolutely. coming together, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And with the, uh, with the invasives count, like, like I said, it's all about driving data, just like kind of the information you were just talking about. And we did ask for gut contents and lengths and weights, and it was snakeheads and invasive catfishes. Um, you know, the blue cats are everywhere now. Right. Um, and we're all going to, a decade from now, look back and go, okay, that's what happened. I mean, you can sit here all day long and talk about what might happen. Right. You guys are seeing massive changes in your environment down there. There's changes happening all over the place. And I know there's a, this ongoing debate about do we manage snakeheads you know, for catch and release versus keeping them and should we make them a game fish and all this kind of stuff. And all these things are kind of confused, nuanced conversations. And the reality is, no matter what somebody wants the outcome to be for snakeheads, we need data because the state law and the way that the professionals at Maryland DNR operate is based on science. And they have to have that tell the story. Um, and so, you know, we had 92 participants last year uh, log 198 fish. That data has been submitted to Maryland DNR. 198 and, snakeheads? Well, it was, it was a mostly snakeheads. Um, it was a combination of blue catfish, flatheads, and snakeheads. Okay. Um, but mostly snakeheads. Um, and that information has been provided to DNR without anybody's names because anything that DNR gets is you know, subject to Public Information Act and all that kind of stuff. So we completely conceal the people's names. We just provide the length, the weight, and the pictures of the fish. Um, if, if DNR needs the pictures and, and, the, and, and, and the location, if, if they provide, they don't have to provide the location, correct? Well, so yeah, in the, in the invasives count, we, we did require the location in order for them to receive a prize. Okay. But the well, location is just the river, not the, exactly. not the GPS Yeah. Yeah. Coordinate. We didn't need a GPS cord. That's what I want to stress to people, you know, that if you're turning in your yeah. data and you're turning in, you know, something you've done that. You know, you don't have to put exactly where you were. It's okay. Kaz can't read latitude and longitude anyway. <laughs> I can read pictures. That's about it. <laughs> well, and that's and that's so folks absolutely have the option in the angler uh, in, in the iAngler uh, tournament app to turn off their location settings, but they can turn it on, and a lot of people do because a lot of folks recognize that we're not we're not providing the information publicly to anyone. Sure. Um, and and it's just simply for DNR to try and put together a plan so they can address the management of these species for the general public and. It's the outcomes, you, you know, you folks can't forecast an outcome and just say, I'm not doing that because I think they're going to do this with the information. Well, you know, I can respect that opinion and all that kind of thing, but I, I'd urge folks to get involved. And, you know, my phone number is all over the place. If folks want to get into the, the, the nitty gritty and details of fisheries management and how it works, I'm very fortunate to be in a position to work in this arena every single day on behalf of anglers, on behalf of the resource. And I, uh, another hat I wear is something called the Marine Resource Education Program. It helps teach people about how to get involved in fisheries management. Um, and then I'm also now just uh, appointed to the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission as the legislative proxy. So the, the coastwide body that manages rockfish and cobia and spot and 
croaker and all these other fish that live throughout the Atlantic coast, this is, this is the body that has to sit down and work together and represent every state up and down the coast and try and figure out how to manage our resources. And it's never easy, but I'm happy to be there on the front lines on behalf of anglers. So if anybody has questions about how all this stuff comes together, it's a big part of my day to day. And, um, you know, we want folks to just be involved and be educated and, and be informed anglers, just like you guys always talk about it. It's such an important part of, of our community. Um, and you know what we need to do together. So for the, the great invasive species count for this year, um, we're kicking off April 1st, you know, that was kind of a put together at the last minute last year, but this year we've got a much, much longer timeline here. So April 1st, uh, it's going to, it's going to go live. Uh, we'll have registrations probably around March 1st. Um, and we're looking for folks to support the event. Uh, the basic structure is starts April 1st, ends October 31st. We figured that captures a good chunk of the time of year where folks are going to be catching a bunch of snakeheads and be out fishing because the weather is nice. So that, that just seemed like a good window, that seven month period there. I think it's great. And, uh, yeah, yeah, and what we're asking is, you know, folks like you guys to, to step up and say, all right, we're, we're willing to be a partner. Um, we want to help promote it. I think what we're going to do is break things up into region, but also break things up uh, into month to month and give folks an opportunity to, uh, to like, do a takeover of social media platforms and, and just, you know, share as much information as we can about, about snakeheads, blue cats, their impact, you know, tips and techniques how we're going fishing for them, the, the great tackle that's available, you know, some of the great programs that, that you guys are running down with the store and, and Blackwater's Edge. I mean, it's great to, you know, that we can all work together like this and, and have the technology like iAngler where anywhere you're going fishing, you can submit a picture of that fish and provide data to DNR and possibly win a prize. So we'll probably do uh, monthly prizes over the seven month period. Um, last year we gave away a bunch of great prizes from AFCO and Engel coolers and, and um, all sorts of good stuff. And the, there will be incentives for people that are CCA members. Um, anybody can become a CCA member. Just go to ccamd.org slash join. Um, and if you're, you are an active member, you get better prizes. But anybody can participate in the Great Chesapeake Invasives Count for free. Doesn't cost you anything, and, and you can still win some prizes. And I'm looking here, you know, my, my good my good friend Rob Ballantyne, he's a biologist, and he's watching right now, and, he's, and he said, anglers need to get on board with reporting. We've had 50-plus snakehead days last spring, you yep. know, so. Well, another thing, too, is if you're gut sampling mm -hmm. your fish as you catch them or when you get done, if you, if you do it as you're catching them, that's one of the preferred methods of uh, euthanizing them. Right, yep. exactly. Great point. And, and legal ways. Right. If, yeah. if, you've, if you've got, you don't have to whack him on the head. Or <laughs> yeah, there's, there's no chance that, that he's going to survive that. Right. That's just, just point by period. You, you never know, know man. <laughs> Snakes on a plane, bro. No. <laughs> no, that's exactly right. And, um, you know, we I got tons of great pictures of folks. I mean, some of the, one of the guys, um, Dave McCollum, who is an Upper Bay angler. You know, I know really Dave. He's a, he's a hell of an angler, man. I love that guy. Yeah, I was talking to him today. Um, he won two angle coolers, an AFCO knife, and I, had, I ended up getting to the point where I said, Dave, you can't win anything anymore. You're catching so many fish. He's a good fisherman. Um, yeah, so he caught 193 snakeheads last year. Mm. Not, a, not a single one was below Pools Island. So if you think about that, it's the upper bag, you know, the, the very upper bag. They've caught all those 193, basically in the tough way in the drain, you know, right there in the in, below the dam. I know where he fishes. Um, yeah, and, <laughs> I mean, there was one creek in particular that you couldn't believe how many he caught, and he wouldn't care if I said it, but I'm not going to. Um, but the bottom line is they're, they're everywhere, right? And, and there's got to be impacts we don't quite know. And, you know, think about striped bass. Um, they're mm. staging to spawn mm. right now, mm. and, and we've got we've really got to do our part. You guys have been preaching it for a long time, and it's a, it's a big deal. Um, so, you know, we're not out to find people's spots or anything like that, but we're here to do our part as anglers and stand up and guess what? You'll be rewarded for it. I, so. I, I think as anglers, we have a responsibility to our waterways for that. You know, that's all. And that, well, that's just the bottom that's line, cool you know, to, period. Yeah. So what do they say to one, uh, to people that much is given, uh, much is expected. That's not right. What's the quote? I don't know. There's some famous thing. <laughs> Close enough. We won't, we won't, like we won't. <laughs> <laughs> much is expected. That. That's right. Too much is given, much is expected. So, so, so last year, you know, the, the invasive things went really good, and we have a, a good feeling that it's going to be probably. I, I, I would think with the exposure you got last year, that you're going to at least double that this year. I would think, you know, and that's that's at least what I would like to see happen for you guys, anyway. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. 
And I think I think the best thing that we can do is, like we've said, help each other to promote this stuff back and forth and get the word out. And and we know it's going to be different everywhere. But but the bottom line is, like you did say, Dave, there there's going to be an ultimate impact somewhere, and it's going to be felt in some way. You know, where it's going to be for each of these rivers and creeks and stuff individually, nobody knows. You know, we're watching yep. some we're watching some places just fall apart. You know, we're watching other places not fall apart so much. We're seeing small bass still there. We're seeing some bluegills still there. You know, and then we're seeing other places that might not even be seeing much of anything yet, you know. Time takes time. That's the biggest thing that I don't think people look at in this whole picture, you know. We just can't make a judgment today, you know. I know from what we've seen in the Blackwater study, you know, that that's data and that's factual data and that, that backs up what we've seen here, you know. The only way to get the, the right scenario nailed down for each of these rivers and creeks is, like you said, to collect the data. And the only way we can do that is if the anglers get involved and utilize this eye angler. So everybody out there that's that's paying attention and doing this, I think we just lost yeah, Dave. Yeah, I think we just lost Dave. <laughs> we'll, we'll get him back. We'll get him back. But, yeah, so, you know, I mean, I think the biggest thing is that if we all work together and, and we all just try to help one another, you know, this isn't about who's a better angler, Hello. who catches more, who does this or not. So, <laughs> we'll get you back in a minute, Dave. We're coming. <laughs> we got your voice, man. We're close. <laughs> he must have lost service. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, but, um, but, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, the biggest thing that we're seeing here is, is the numbers, you know? I mean, the numbers are just pretty crazy and pretty crazy. Now, I do know that I've talked to Justin, and he, he set some, some he nets in some different areas this year. So, we're going to start looking at some other areas in Blackwater that we haven't netted yet and see what we see in these new areas. And I can tell you that from just what we're seeing – in the last two weeks, and we're not even hot yet, I have a feeling that these nets are really going to load up. And when I say load up, I think we're going to see a couple thousand pounds a week coming out of these nets up where we're at, mm-hmm. you know? So I'm really glad to see that Justin moved the nets to a new area, you know, that we can work on a new area to get some snakeheads out of. Still in the old places too, yeah, I mean, they're still in the old places, yeah. But, I mean, the biggest thing is this. Even still in Blackwater, I was talking to Chris Meister the other day, okay? Now, now right now at 335, when you're over there top and bottom – you know, bottom bottom fishing, you know, top and bottom rig with a piece of blood worm or a minnow, you could catch two yellow perch at a time and you could have your limit there literally in 20 minutes. You know, you could be done. Right. fish. We still have not seen any yellow perch in the net yet. Not one. You know, Meister went over there the other day and sat there for a couple hours. Nothing. Kept calling me. He's like, man, I don't know. I said, try the other side. Try this. Try that. So, I mean, there's definitely impacts, and we definitely see it here. You know, and some of the guys I'm talking to up there, I got a friend at Nets of Gunpowder. He's telling me, you know, that the yellow perch numbers he's seeing this year are not quite what they were last year at all, 50%. I got some guys over in the Bush River outside the Amtrak's got nets set. And uh, same thing there. I mean, there's there's just not, not the numbers of fish. Guys that I'm talking to up in Gray's Run. I mean, that's a place that's indicted with millions of them little yellow perch. I hear them guys aren't really seeing much of that at all yet. So I, I don't know what's going on, you know? I mean, it's kind of – it kind of just throws curveballs everywhere, you know? It's like you, you expect one thing, and then this is happening, and then you have to step two, take two steps back and, and regroup and, and think about what you're really looking at, you know? And just from what I'm seeing, I mean, the people I'm talking to, the gunpowder, the Bush River, I mean, the Susquehanna. I mean, the Susquehanna I'm not hearing too much, you know? Not, not too much in the way of change. Uh, but, like, these other smaller rivers, I mean, you're seeing stuff happen there faster. You know, the gunpowder, Days Cove. I mean, Days Cove is like a mosquito. <laughs> it's got so many – it's like mosquitoes here on the eastern shore, no lie. So, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, it's – we don't know, you know. And, and like you said, that's why it's so important for us to collect this data. That's why it's so important for us to get, you know, the, the, these gut samples and to see what's going on and get these links and get some growth, you know, see what they're growing, how fast things are happening, you know. The good thing about Rob Ballantyne, who was just – I was talking to you a minute ago. Now, he's done some own, some of his own independent studies on growth plates, and he, he's, a, he's a guy, I think, Dave, that would be really, really useful for CCA, and he might be able to help you guys with aging some fish, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, like maybe yeah. if somebody sent in scales, you know, he could take the scales and he could, he could age those fish out, and then we could see really – you know what? Just the thought, just a, just a random thought. You know, I mean, this this is a way that we can maybe see how fast they're growing too. You know what I mean? And what what does a one year old snakehead in the Bush River look like? Because we know a one year old snakehead here can be fourteen inches, and reproducing yep. and reproducing in eight to nine months. Right. You well, know? that's the kind of those are the kind of surveys and studies that actually shape things like striped bass management. You know, DNR is out there in the field doing young of year surveys and and taking scales off of big fish, off the of little fish, and and doing all that kind of stuff. Well, they don't have the capacity. Like we said earlier, they don't have an invasive species program. They can barely get done with the work they need to get done on every fishery. Right. Um, so they don't have the capacity to do this thing. So exactly what you're talking about is the mentality that inspired the Thai Angler, inspired the Great Invasives Count. Um, CCA has 
we call this citizen science, right? And it's not perfect. It never is. Sure. You always have to work with the experts to talk to them about data collection and the information they want. So it's usable. And that's what we're doing. I just had that call this week with, you know, the inland fisheries folks at, at Maryland DNR. So they could help guide me in making our event better this year. Um, and then a whole other piece of the puzzle of things we do is a, a tagging program um, where CCA members can participate through the American Littoral Society. And we actually tag rockfish, bluefish, flounder, you know, the, some bigger fish. Um, so, you know, it's these kinds of things, again, where it's anglers stepping up to help out a little bit, you know, find out some really cool information. And frankly, if you get involved in the science of fisheries and, and helping out with surveys and data and all that, you become a better angler. And, I mean, how many the, the guys that keep the good log books are the guys that continually catch the most fish because they have that data and that experience, right? And I don't know, you know, it, it's it, fun it, stuff and, and folks need to get involved. It's kind of funny because, like, when I share my gut content pictures with people, you know, I mean, the first thing that we talk about, the first thing they say to me is, good Lord, man, why do you have so many? And I have so many so that I can kind of – gut sampling has really helped me as an angler, you know, to choose the correct lures, exactly. to choose the correct size of baits. There, there, there's a side to gut sampling that I don't think a lot of anglers see. And I know some anglers see it as, oh, they're just killing the fish and ripping it apart. For me, it's a learning avenue. You know, when I open that fish up and I'm flaying that fish and I want to check the stomach, I, I'm checking that stomach because I'm compiling my own data and my own brain of what these fish are eating. You know what I'm saying? And then I'm able to take that back to the store or to a tackle shop and kind of infuse what I've already learned through the gut sampling in my lure selection for my next trip, you know? So yep. you try to find, the, I mean, we can find bad points. We can find good points about everything, but I, I try to find the good points in what I'm doing. You know, what, what is, what is, what is the outcome of what I'm doing going to be, you know? And I know what the outcome it's is. Gonna <laughs> it's going to be dinner. Right. I know that, <laughs> but I'm just saying, I mean, we learned last year that, you know, I mean, these, these fish could eat a six pound carp, but no right. problem. That's you what know? I was just about to say. Well, I mean, you don't know, until you open the fish, you don't right. know if he's eating something three inches long. Sure. Four inches long, ten inches long, whatever. And the other thing, like big fish. You know, I was able to pattern my bigger fish through gut sampling. And that's the God's honest mm -hmm. truth. You know, when I started chasing bigger fish, I paid attention to what they were eating. That opened yep. a big door for me, to be honest with you. Well, what do you always say? Match the hatch. Yeah, match I mean, the hatch, yeah. But you, I, you can't match it if, you're, if you don't know what they're eating. But how many times period. did I come back to you a couple years ago? Dude, I told you, man, six-inch bluegill look bad. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I just, Ricky had the 20, a 32-inch snakehead that had a 24-inch channel cat right. in its stomach. I mean, it was in there. Well, just like Alex's bow, bow oh, fish yeah, yeah, in the yeah, tournament. Yeah, it was, it was yeah. a 20, what is it, 26 inches, and it had an 18-inch 18 18 snake yeah, in its yeah, belly, yeah, yeah. just yeah. hanging out its wow. mouth. Wow. Yep. So. And, and that was well, legit. And that it, was legit. That was not a stage no. thing. When the no. DNR no. pulled that out of his mouth, I mean, the back end of that snake head had already hit the stomach yeah, it acid and was rotting yeah. away. What a lot of people don't understand, too, is these snake heads have one of the fastest digestive systems of any fish out there. So once they eat, if you can't get in there – a lot of guys will say, I got my fish home. There was nothing in it, man, when I opened it up. I've opened nine of them up, and there ain't nothing in it out of ten. That's why they bit your lure. Of course, that's why they <laughs> ate your lure. They were hungry. Their small stomach was empty. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean. <laughs> I, was a, I was about to say that. that one of the guys that we had in the tournament kept providing, uh, he'd take a picture of his fish, tell us how long it was. If he weighed it, he told us how, long, uh, how much it weighed. Um, but then in the notes section, because you can add notes, he would say, stomach empty, full of eggs and explain all that kind of stuff. And, yep. and I think the vast majority of the fish he caught were stomach empty and full of eggs. Yeah, and I mean, most, thing, most of the fish... The male ratio was, was high. Yeah, we talked mm. about it before. Yeah. Like eight or nine yeah. to one. Yeah. 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 Well, and anyway. we also get, we also get um, you know, talking about, like, so I angler, you can absolutely use it as your own log book. And, you know, we all know moon phase and, and that kind of stuff affects fish. Tide, of course, affects them. But... You know, the more and more you build these logs, these database log books for yourself, you can find out you know, some correlations in why the fish bit when they did. And that's one thing that I've, I've done personally with eye anglers. I log all the fish I catch just from my own personal records. And unfortunately, there aren't that many records in there because I don't go fishing enough. I just talk about it every day. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're all, I think we're, getting, we're, we're, we're getting that way here too. Yeah. We're so busy with everything. You no, know, hunting's uh, the same way. You look at weather patterns and, and, and whatever. What now, I, I, I do want to mention something real quick, Dave, because my, my good friend Roy Boyd up here at Westside, he's watching right now, and, he, and he's paying attention, and he's saying, you know, he wants to get involved. 
So maybe, yeah. may, may, maybe we'll reach out to him after the show, you know, see what he can do up there to help us out, help you out, you know, with CCA and getting some data collecting things like that. Roy's a really good friend of mine. I've known him my whole life since I was 18 years old we were, or 16. We were best friends when I was a kid, and I'm glad to see him doing it up there. I'd like to see him get more involved. So if we can help him out a little bit, let's, uh, let's try to do that. You know what I mean? That's exactly right. And that's what I'm talking about with, like, the seven months and all the partners. I'm not looking for cash from the soul. It's free for everybody to participate. Yep. And we're looking for donations and promotion. You, you and we just want help. We you, just want help. That's it. You know, we just yeah. want help. You know? Yeah, count, yeah, us, so, count us in to help you. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so we'll bring everybody together. Everybody's welcome. It's, it's what it's all about. And uh, and we're going to have some fun with this event. And In fact, uh, there's plenty of other fun stuff we're going to do, too. You want to talk a little bit about Habitat? Yeah. I mean, let's talk about some reef balls, man. You want to talk about that? Yeah. Yeah, so okay. a big part of what, what CCA does is, is uh, again, educating folks, getting them engaged and promoting, you know, responsible use of the outdoors. And we can sit here and debate all day long about what's happening with these fish and who should catch what and what the rules are and all that, because that's a big part of conservation. But, you know, you got to give back and recognize what produces these animals as well. And you got to have healthy habitat, clean water. I was going to say earlier when you were talking about the yellow perch, you know, when as soon as a, a the watershed has about 10 percent impervious surface in its watershed yellow perch populations have been have been observed to decline and that's that's the on land impact of these fish well now you add you know you add your invasive species like we've been talking about right. now you're getting squeezed from both sides so we absolutely need to fix things on land it is paramount but it's not an excuse to say let's not do important things in the water as well right and you know, we're heavily involved in, in oyster management and all the complexity of that. Last night, I was on the Oyster Advisory Commission. I'm on that. I'm on that. I'm trying to. How do you have time for all these that. boards that you're on? Jeez, <laughs> do you have do you have like four mini knees that you send around or what? <laughs> I have a patient. I have a patient wife, and uh, and it's my job. I mean, it really is. So, I'm, because of our members, I'm able to uh, to participate in all this stuff. And boy, do I talk a lot and stare into a, a computer screen a lot. Um, <laughs> But so habitat, right? That's where before COVID, um, we would get out. It's called the Living Reef Action Campaign is our program. Started in Carroll County with students building reef balls in elementary schools. We have a enclosed trailer full of molds. It's actually being borrowed by the Chesapeake Bay Environmental Center right now. Big shout out to Vicki uh, in Graysonville. Um, and we work with all sorts of different organizations and corporate partners, but mostly schools to educate kids about why wa clean water is important, how the watershed works how you, oysters help clean the water. Yes, they're also a seafood. Um, how underwater grasses are important. They help crabs, other seafood. You know, you got baby rockfish and perch and everything in this big system, right? Well, oysters are a keystone species. They're a very big, important part of the Bay, of course, and our heritage and our culture. Um, and there's something called a reef ball. So a reef ball is, uh, is, was created by the Reef Ball Foundation. We work with them. We buy molds from them. And using these molds, we get kids to build reef balls. So we teach them all sorts of stuff in, inside and in the classroom. And we go outside and they actually roll up their sleeves, set up molds, mix concrete, work in teams, and make these reef balls. Well, once they're made, they harden overnight. We remove the molds. We throw them on a trailer. We go and store them to put into the water. Well, we've got a brand new website we put together thanks to supported by the Reef Ball Foundation. Um, our National Habitat Trust, the Building Conservation Trust, which is an important part of CCA that helps fund habitat programs everywhere, and a really, really cool partnership we have with the No Shoes Reef Foundation. So any Kenny Chesney fans out there? Oh, Kenny yeah. created yeah. the No Shoes Reef Foundation to help build reefs and improve ocean habitat throughout the world. So we're fortunate enough to have him be a board member of our National Building Conservation Trust and work with his foundation. So they actually help pay develop a brand new website it's um ccamd.org slash habitat and this is the new, this is the new web page right dave yeah this yeah, is the okay. new part of the cca website yep so it's ccamd.org slash habitat and couldn't do it without you know our great friends at the no shoes reef foundation and, and reef ball foundation so the whole point of this page is to try and tell the story of habitat conservation and why it's important and how it relates to clean water and then the action we can take so the action we have been taking is this Living Reef Action Campaign. And if, when you scroll down on that page, you'll see some pinpoints on a map. And I'm a visual guy. I still order from the menu, you know, from the pictures on the menu at Bob Evans. And, you know, I, so I like these maps and these pictures. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> it's supposed to, right? 
busted the Mexican Chinese restaurants. <laughs> 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 yeah, you got it. <laughs> that was a good one, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I took us off track there for a minute. That's okay. We need we needed to do that. <laughs> so, so but but you'll see a map on there. You'll also see some underwater footage of one of the reefs we've already built, and that's from uh, just west of Tillman Island. Um, so we put over reef balls with oysters attached to them. Um, they're they're uh, hatchery grown oysters, um, but but natural, you know, the the native species, and they grow these reefs. And there's actually been some recent studies, and I know you all had Johnny Shockley on a couple. Yeah, he's episodes a good ago. dude. Johnny's a great guy and a visionary. Yeah. Johnny's been working so hard on the nutrient removal stuff he was talking about on the podcast. And I, we're, I was blown away by that, like the whole the whole stock and payment and the way that thing would work out and all that. I mean, that is just that blew my mind. You know, I wonder then, I wonder how many oysters Conowingo Dam's going to have to buy. Right. Well, that's, that's the way <laughs> no. it should be. You know, it's so important to do things that actually create a net benefit, a positive benefit, and not just spend money on something just to spend money on something. And that's what we really try and do. We try and advance the science of what we're doing. We're engaging the community to do it, to build reef balls. Uh, the Tillman Island Reef and also the Bill Burton Pier in Cambridge both have reef balls uh, that are the same size. They're called a mini bay reef ball. They're about 300 pounds. Um, and both were they're covered in oyster sp uh, spat originally and then deployed. And both were deployed by the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. They've got a, a special boat, Patricia Campbell, that does this work. Yep. Uh, and we're great to have them as a partner to do this. And most folks that fish the Bill Burton Pier don't even know that there's a reef at the end of it. And on both sides. They do now. They do now. Yeah. I won't, I won't, I won't be able to get my spot no more, Dave. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no, just kidding. Well, and so we, we have applied for a really cool uh, grant that we'll talk about if we get it. But you can – Guarantee that we're going to be focusing on habitat throughout 2021. We just had uh, McGuire Marine Construction, uh, the Magatee River Association, just pitched in to deploy reef balls, I think, two weeks ago in the Magatee River. Um, I know there's a picture on our Facebook page, and that was a volunteer effort. A volunteer showed up at a reef ball build at a middle school in, in Arundel County. He showed up, and he goes, hey, Dave, I wanted to help out today. I said, great. Thanks, Colin. Shows up. He gets to work. We built the reef balls. Well, about midway through the, the reef ball build, he says to me, hey, Dave, what are you going to do with these? I said, I don't know. You got somewhere you want to put them? He said, well, I volunteer for the Magatee River Association, and I work down at Cypress Marine. Uh, how about, can we have some to put in a reef in the Magatee River? I said, yeah, let's go. So over the oh, next yeah. month and a half, yeah, we, we ended up delivering, I think it was like 115 of them or so. Wow, that's uh, fantastic. Down there. Yeah, it? they put 100 of them in the Magatee uh, just two weeks ago. Wow. And, where do, you take them, Dave, to, uh, where do you take them to get the spats uh, planted on them? So in, in the Magazine River situation, there was no spat on these. Um, and, and it's all a matter of scheduling and comp a lot of complexity. Um, right. Funding, of course, too. But um, So with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, they have an oyster restoration center in Shadyside. So they're the ones we've worked with to set spat on reef balls before. Um, we, we stockpile the reef balls there. Um, and then, you know, set a block in their schedule. They actually order the the spat. Um, one one year it came from Horn Point. I was going to say so, I was yeah. going to ask if Horn Point do anything. Yeah, yeah. So the yeah. Horn Point spat, you know, the, that they grow there, larval oysters. They literally put it in a FedEx container, ship it across the bay <laughs> overnight, ends up in in, uh, in Shady Side, and, <laughs> and you know, CBF does this stuff for uh, for spat on shell as well. And there's others that do spat on shell throughout the bay. And ORP, of course, uh, working with Horn Point. But it's the same concept. You put the larval oysters in the tank of water that's been it's been brought up to temperature. Um, they're pumping the, the creek water in, so it's you know natural. It has algae in it. Once they know that the oysters have set, it, you know, it takes a couple days to look at some sample shells they put in there under a microscope and see if the spat have set. And if they have, they know that they've set to the reef balls too. So at that point, they'll let the water out and then start circulating new water that has algae in it that the, you know, the spat oysters can start eating. Um, and then we load the reef balls on the deck, keep them wet, run them out to the reef site, and they drop them to the bottom, and they're in their forever home and happy as can be. Um, and so the Tillman site and the Bill Burton site were actually studied by uh, folks at Horn Point. Um, and there's this national panel on nutrient mitigation I think Johnny may have talked about. Um, and they actually studied those reef balls to figure out how much nitrogen and phosphorus they could take out of the water. So the actual reef ball was studied as well as a kind of a flat Very uh, cool. oyster bar. Yeah, so 
we actually know that the Tillman Reef Falls did a little bit better. They have a higher density of, of oysters on them. Um, people were catching black sea bass there all summer. They were keepers. That that was um, the thing I wanted to ask you. Like, do do you follow <laughs> up and go down and check and check these reef balls out to see how they're doing after they've been dropped? I mean, is that something that that that, that they do to to like monitor them? I mean, yep, yep. So the video, cameras? yeah, the video you see on the habitat page is from um, Ten Island Scuba. They do training scuba dives, and they take people out there. Okay. They, cool. They've got some videos from nighttime, daytime, um, and so we rely on that. Um, Stevenson University is doing a, a dive study. Who, who was that again you just set up in Ken Island? Uh, Ken Island Scuba. Brad okay. King. Okay. Let's give him a little yep. plug. They've been volunteering their time. and um, In fact, we actually dropped a reef of concrete pipe back in uh, February of 17 um, in Tangier Sound on a triangle-shaped reef site. Um, so that was like pipe reef, very similar to what they do off in Ocean City with Ocean City Reef Foundation. Um, and we were looking for actually divers to head down there. Now, if I, I now, now, if I, now not to cut you off. Now, if I'm, I'm, yeah. if I'm thinking correct, down in Ocean City, Monty Hawkins, he plays a big role with you guys down there. Am I right? Yep, yep. Okay. And in fact, I'm on the Habitat page, you can see there's a link to Ocean City Reef Foundation where Captain Monty leads. Um, and very soon there's going to be a lot more spots open up on the map. So they're going to be reefs and we're, you know, we're working with Monty to tell the story of the work he's doing. Um, he actually has a really cool product called a reef pyramid where there's going to be more molds available soon. And there, there'll be these fiberglass molds that will leave at, uh, at uh, concrete sites, like either a mixed plant or, or a construction yard. Right. Cause every truck always has a little bit of extra concrete and a little bit of extra concrete isn't exactly practical for a reef ball build. We usually just go, from scratch out of bags or, or mix from scratch. Now you were um, saying earlier, I, I want I want people to, to realize how simple this is. How many yeah. how many bags of concrete were you telling me before the show that we you need to use to make a reef ball? It's pretty. It's not. It's not a lot. No, it's about three. Yeah, Eighty pound bags. Yeah, it depends yeah. what size. We build a couple different sizes. So so cost wise, you're really talking like twelve bucks to to pour to, to pour this thing. Yep. Yep. And yep. a big part of what we have to invest in of course is we have two enclosed trailers um in fact the second enclosed trailer was originally built for southern maryland but with covid hitting we couldn't do any work in southern maryland so late last uh september october actually we built with um straight edge construction so their company in salisbury um uh, brian their their owner called me and said hey monty hawkins told me you guys put build reef balls and put them in the bay i want to learn about how to do that well it wasn't a month later i showed up in his driveway he volunteered all his time, bought everybody lunch, brought his employees out, and we built reef balls at his house in, in October. Those reef balls are going to go to the James Island reef site right outside of Crisfield in 2021. So we've got all these kinds of things happening. The bottom line is with the Living Reef Action Campaign, it just takes a couple couple folks and say, hey, I want to help. How can I help? They reach out to me. My email is david at ccamd.org. And we try and work together to fit it in my schedule. Um, Danny Wynn of Acme Tile. Danny's actually uh, stepped up to be a partner this year. Very good. Um, yeah, and we're going to build build reef balls with him. I'm not sure if it's going to be the Salisbury location or, or Cambridge, um, but we're working with him. Um, cool. We got a great donation of concrete, thanks to him and his brother-in-law from U.S. Concrete Products. So, I mean, CCA is a grassroots organization that can only do what, what we can because of really generous volunteers and folks that say, hey, I got an idea. Let's, let's see what we can do. So my job is to make those ideas into reality by working with great partners. And that's what the reef ball thing's all about. And we're really excited. There's going to be a lot more to talk about as the year progresses in, in the lower Eastern shore. That's good stuff, man. Hopefully once we see the light at the end of the tunnel with all this COVID stuff and schools, we'll get back into the schools. Um, but we're just not there yet. So we're, we're, I'm filling my time with all sorts of other good stuff. You got plenty to do. That's yeah, for sure. Yeah, let, let me interrupt a little bit, real quick. Uh, so here's a here's a here's a little package we're going to give away from old school tackle company. Our good friend Brian Dolph down there. Uh, if you'd like to get this pack of swim baits here, I'll give that to you. Just uh, what what do you want to put in the comments, Eddie? Um, how about the great invasive count? I like it. So the first person to write the great invasive count in the comments, you get that bag from old school tackle company. Um, Dave, while we're I talking, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I have my, I, have my <laughs> I didn't mean to cut you off. I just want to get that plug in there real quick. I know we're getting up on time and stuff like that. So no, that's great. No, it's, it's you know, bottom line, is, uh, there's so much great stuff we can do together. And I look forward to helping you guys out with, uh, with your snakehead stuff this year, yeah. your tournaments and 
in your club. I plan on being a member. Yeah, so um, so while, while we're mentioning that, Eddie, why don't you go ahead and let's just bring everybody up to date where we are with yep. the tournaments, the Snakehead Club, what we got going on. Real quick, uh, Nicholas, you got the baits. All right, Nicholas. Yep. Uh, I'm not even gonna try to say last name. You got it, Nick. <laughs> it's yours, baby. <laughs> you might you might kick my ass. I say it wrong. <laughs> All right, so uh, that's right. Just a reminder on our tournament dates: we got the first one May 1st. Mark them on your calendar: June 19th, July 31st, and September 18th. So, and we're still looking for sponsors. You know, if yep. you if you want to be a we're corporate sponsor, things details, like that. Yeah, working about a lo- lot of stuff out. We got a lot of stuff available. If anybody wants to sponsor categories, yep. Calcutta, anything like that, reach out to us. Uh, we got a lot of people reaching out now. Yeah, we'll, we'll have a more official announcement once we have all the details worked out. But just just mark your calendars because it, it's coming. And tell them a little bit about the Snakehead Club. Oh man, you're you're. That's, that's on a different page. We ain't even there yet. Okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, uh, oh, no, you got to turn the page. <laughs> well, no, well, no, because we're going to give them a discount if they join everything. Yeah, right? that's, that's so exactly we, right. We want to yeah. bring that up to them, you know what I mean? <laughs> but no, yeah, we're starting the uh, the, the uh, Snakehead Club, and it's going to be $50 for the year to enter it and, join. To, and to join the club. And, and the tournament's going to be $60 each. So all together, it'd be $290. Um, but we're going to give you a discount if you want to do all of them at once, and that'd be get it all for two fifty. Yeah, so. that's a hell of a deal. So yeah, for can, sure. Get everything, get all four tournaments and club membership. I mean, you can't beat that. You know, that's a pretty pretty good price where I'm from. I know yep, that exactly right. And 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 the thing about the club because everybody's been asking, do they have to come here for the meetings? No, you don't have to come here for the meetings. No. What we're going to do is we're going to, if you're a club member, you can watch the meeting live. You know, from here wherever we're going to hold it at or whatever. Right. So if you're in Western Maryland or you're in California and you want to be a part of the club, you can do that. And all or you have Florida, to do is just be Georgia. wherever. Yeah, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, anywhere. It doesn't matter. Yeah, maybe California. Uh, I mean, South yeah. America. I don't care. <laughs> you know, Indonesia, wherever you want to be. You Taiwan. Know? Yeah, come on. Uh, so, I mean, this would be a good way for, for us to network with one another. And the good thing is is w- w- we will broadcast our meetings live. What, you we, know? what we want to do is, is to bring the community of the serious snakehead anglers together. That's what this is really for. The 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 – Everybody who wants to interact with each other, learn some new tricks from each other, and and really build this community of, of the diehard snakehead anglers. That that's what we're looking for in the snakehead club. I, I think it's going to be great. We're going to have we're going to have special guests each yeah, oh month. Yeah. You yes, know, prizes, giveaways yep. every every meeting. Yep. You know, so uh, we're working on the venue now, trying to iron all that out. You'll be able to get hopefully something to eat when you come if you want to do something like that. You know, we're going to try to make it really uh, convenient for everybody. And we figured that if we did the the live broadcast that that would make it convenient for right. everybody. Yeah, we're, you we're didn't just have to, to be here, yeah. you know. So I mean, we we know snakeheads are all over the place. They're yeah. on the, all, all over Maryland and up and down the east. To ask a guy so. to drive from West Virginia or Frederick to come right. here for a meeting for it's, an hour, it's just unfeasible. Yeah. So, so, so we're and as long as COVID's in place, right? And, it's impossible to do anyway. Right. So it's we're just trying to make it as easy on as possible. How many possible. people can be there? But yep. But if you remember the club, you can. Watch it on the internet. That's right. You, you join and, the live stream. And, 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 and the other thing, too, you know, we said, you know, if you join the club, you know, you, we, we might even offer some discounts here on Tackle, you know, and things like right. that. Right, yeah, we got some know? other stuff we're working through. Yeah, so, I mean, we got a lot of stuff that we're looking to, to, to step up the game this year in the snakehead ground and, you know, really, really put some stuff out there, you know what I'm saying? Yep. Um, it be a good year of fishing. I, For sure. I, I heard, I Dave, I heard I heard something about Kent Narrows um, maybe, maybe shutting something down up there. Have you heard anything about that? Yeah, so another part of my job is uh, my lobbyist hat. So okay. technically, I'm a grassroots lobbyist, meaning I'm... How many hats do you I, have? I, <laughs> it's like 3,582. <laughs> I'm, I'm counting now, Too dude. many. <laughs> Too many. But, but it's a big part of what CCA has always done is track legislation and engage in, in you know, weighing in on stuff on behalf of anglers. And every once in a while, we're supporting different bills that we're trying to get passed. We're, we're the ones that uh, started the 365-day license by initiating legislation to do that. So the reason that your license is good for the entire year um, is because of CCA. Um, but so this year, there's a lot going on. It's a virtual legislative session right now, so it's a bit different. Um, but there was just a bill introduced. Uh, it's House Bill 1117, so 1117. Um, and what it does is prohibits people from fishing on the uh, on the right of way, the, within the state highway right of way at the Kent Narrows Bridge what the bill says so so that would mean you can't fish off the bridge is that is that what i'm kind of feeling here that's what i understand yeah mm. yeah and it's um what happens with the legislative process is you know any delegate or senator can can draft a bill and propose that uh this is delegate Arendt, uh who's a middle eastern shore delegate um and you know there's always a reason so you know i always tell people number one reach out to the delegate or the, or the senator that would introduce it their staff are great they you know they work really hard you just got to be respectful and say, hey, can we understand more about this? Um, and if you go on the General Assembly website, 
you can find out a lot more and, and um, just Google that. Roy Boyd, hold, hold on, Roy Boyd. I just want to get in here real quick to make it off, Dave. Roy Boyd, you won the rod. Yep. That was that was the that was that was his twelve four. Twelve four. Roy 12. Boyd, you got 4. it. You got it. There you go. Nice. Awesome. Sorry, yeah, Dave. So the website. The bottom line is Maryland General Assembly website is um, m g a l e g dot maryland dot gov. But you can Google it and figure that out and look for House Bill eleven seventeen. Um, I'm, I forgot to look in, um, but the, for the process wise, the bill is introduced and then it goes is, a, is assigned to a committee. Um, and so in the House, it's the Environment and Transportation Committee. Um, and so I'm looking up when the hearing is going to be on this bill because folks can absolutely just follow along. Uh, the committees have a um, an opportunity for you to sign up and provide written testimony or, or oral testimony. Um, and so give me one second, I'm almost there. So, 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 for, so for those that want it or don't want it, either can come to this hearing and they can. No, they they can, can't come to here because it's virtual. Right. Okay. Well, it, yeah, it, it, yeah they, they can't come to it. They, uh, they can attend virtually. Well, that's and, what I mean. And, yeah. In, in the past, you would absolutely go down to the building, walk into the room, sign up for, to, to give testimony. That's what we did, right, we'll Gary? Yeah, we did that we did, last yeah. year for the, for the kayaks. Yeah, now, it, now the way it works is I recommend just reaching out to uh, the legislative staff, um, and they'll let you know what's up. And you, you have an opportunity. There's information all over the uh, legislative website about how you engage. Um, you can track bills. You can actually sign up for an account called My MGA. Um, that's what I do almost every morning. I'm reviewing this stuff. Um, but the bottom line is you can give written testimony, and you have to submit it by 3 p.m. I think it's two days before the hearing. Uh, this hearing in the House is on February 25th at 1.30 p.m. So um, they'll, it'll, the meeting starts at 1.30 you may have to sit through a bunch of other bills, but it's sure. either a matter of watching a Zoom or watching a YouTube live, and you get to follow along and at least hear what folks have to say. And remember, this is step one. The, the House hearing is number one. If there's a Senate version of this bill, then it will have to match, and the Senate committee will have to meet and, and uh, deliberate over this. And then it has to go to the full House and the full Senate. And then you know, both houses have to cross the bill over, and there's deadlines and all this complexity. So, you know, if folks are concerned about this, number one rule is just get involved. Talk to folks, be respectful, and try and understand why. Um, and, you know, fishing access is important. You know, the Chesapeake Bay has, what, 11,000 miles of shoreline or something like that. There's only so much public access. So yep. um, well, we, a lot we, of people We went through that. the same thing with, yeah. with the snakeheads here in Dorchester County. Yep. They went through the same exact issue. It, it's rough. Yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, CCA does take positions on these bills. Um, in, in the next day or two, we should have our full website up that has all the stuff we're tracking and anything we've done. I've been so busy with that work that I haven't had a chance to update the website, but it's coming very soon. The bottom line is if anybody has questions on this kind of stuff, they can reach out to me as well. Um, you guys, well, you know, I can type my, my phone number in the comments, but it's all over our website. And, you know, bottom line is I want folks to be aware of what's going on. There's one other regulation out right now that people can weigh in on on rockfish. Um, last summer we had a two-week closure in August. And um, by the management plan, all days in July and August are equal. But in reality – there can be more mortality at different days because of water temperature Absolutely. in the summertime. Absolutely. Right. So there's a whole bunch of information on DNR's website right now. You go to the, the regulatory fish, uh, the fish fisheries regulatory changes website, or you go to CCA and just scroll to the bottom. And we have some information we provided last October. Bottom line is Maryland DNR is looking for information uh, up until February 16th. They want you to weigh in and, and say, do you support closure in July or closure in August? And, there's a lot of complexity on this issue. Um, by the science, if you're just looking at the, the data, it probably makes sense to close in July. Um, a lot of the charter boat captains are not happy with that because that's a big, important part of their business. Sure. And, you know, rightfully so. So same thing with tackle shops. They're saying, look, we sell so much equipment in July. Why would you close it then? And the reality is all this is really because of some complexity that happened in the last two years where we were all supposed to take reductions and, and kill less rockfish. Maryland DNR chose to certain measures that placed the majority of the reduction on the recreational community. The commercial side was not really cut. Um, and so it, it's a lot of complexity. And it's an allocation kind of battle. And frankly, you can go to our website and, and see our position on it. We were not pleased with, with Maryland DNR uh, dividing people and saying that, you know, some people get two fish, some people get one. You know, it, it's not a debate to me amongst me uh, fellow anglers. I mean, I respect everybody's access and, you know, charter captains are such an important part of our industry and they really wanted two fish and you know i feel like the commercial guys should have given something up too they didn't but you know it's, it's the bottom line is you, you need to weigh in on these topics if you really care you need to show up at the meetings that's why i got so involved with cca as a volunteer before i was able to um, come on full time 
um, because I cared and I just wanted to follow this stuff. So, you know, folks, keep an eye on these things. We're here to help you. I'm here to help Absolutely. you. Absolutely understand how to get engaged and be informed. I don't care if you're a member or not. My phone's always on and we want you to join. We want you to get involved. And, you know, you see stuff about our organization, give me a call. You can, you can talk right to me and understand uh, exactly what we're up to. I got nothing to hide and uh, I'm here to, you know, just honored that I can work on behalf of, of recreational anglers every single day. I, I think one of the, the biggest assets to the fishery that you bring is the same thing that we do. And that that's that you're always available. You know what I mean? You make yep. yourself available and that's, that's hard to do, especially with everything that I know we've got going on. I can't imagine what you've got going on compared to what we got going on. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, he wears yep. a lot of hats. I know, right? Well, and, and, and if you think it doesn't matter to your opinion or, or what you say, it does. I mean, yeah. I, ju I just made a comment to Johnny Motts out here in the parking lot doing one of the the um, tournaments that we had about yep. the, the fact that uh, the way the law was written with, with God, you, you could, it was basically a pedal – Paddle or oar only, you know. And so, yeah. if you had someone with a handicap that uh, or, or physical disability where they couldn't paddle, but they could pedal, you couldn't use it. The way the law was written, you couldn't you couldn't take them. And yep. took a, took a little while, but actually, it is law now. Yeah. Yep. It's finally it, it yep. got signed and and uh, it comes into came into effect. I think in the, the first week of February. I'll tell you what that that was a really cool experience for me to yeah. go up there and to do that with you that day, Gary. I mean, yeah. I I'd, I'd never been to the Naval Academy. I just got to see them jets that day and <laughs> ride a bus and go eat some subway food. And it was it was we a ran fun around day. that jet for fifteen minutes looking for a place to put a quarter in. <laughs> I did, I did, I did. You took Kaz on a field trip, huh, Gary? Yeah. I'm telling you, man. <laughs> oh, you should see me. I was just walking around looking up at buildings like this, man. Like, wow, man, this is pretty cool, man, Gary. What's this place called? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, see, the bottom line is you're not going to change a single bit of re regulation, legislation. And you're probably not going to change anybody's mind arguing on social. Sure. That's right. And just like you all met, you know, the good delegate mouth right there talked about, you know, about stuff with him. And he went and made changes. These, you know, the people we elect here locally, they're our neighbors. They're approachable. They're, they're there. And you really have to think about the way you approach it and whether or not that's going to lead to an effective change. You know, if you're yelling at people and always frustrated and just arguing with people, guess what? People get sick and tired of dealing with you right. after a while. So I say, I'll tell people all the time, they, they always say to me, Dave, how the heck are you such an optimist? I say, it's hard work, but it's a choice. And, and I try and stay positive and try and stay engaged because otherwise, you know, what good is it? You might as well just go pound your head into the wall. Yeah. So respect your fellow angler, get involved. And, and, you know, we're in it together whether we like it or not. So Wait, I don't know what the win is, but we're in it to win it, right? We're in it to win it. <laughs> we're in it to have, have uh, some great snakehead tournaments. I can't wait to have a nice uh, sandwich or something next time I come down to the store. It's we miss you, long. man. We miss you. I can't wait to have dry feet again when I pick my boots back up. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I, I, bought, I bought this pair of ice muck boots like two years ago, right? I'm walking around the other day, and all of a sudden my foot's wet. I look down, man, and right there in that crease in the front, man, that thing done cracked wide open. Man, I got mud inside my boot. I got water inside my boot. I'm going to call them muck people. Be like, what are you doing to me, man? <laughs> the I stopped. My, my feet still stink. Hey, I didn't think about that. Maybe the dog did do it. Who blame the dog? <laughs> it was um, a mutt, not a muck. <laughs> Dave, Dave let, 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 let me just take a minute here to, to do some uh, Snakehead 101 real quick, and we'll come right back to you. Um, I want to reach out and just thank Brady Felch. You know, he uh, he sent us some some baits to check out, and I that's finally got them. Oh, this is the box. Packages, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's that's the name of the company. Just so you know, um, you can check him out. Uh, it's really really nice stuff. I tell you. So this is one of the baits here. You know, and we'll just try to show you that there. And Brady, I'm not sure if you're in here with us, but I'm sure if anybody has any questions, you can reach out to Brady Felch. And, see and I'll tell you the th the thing that I like about is these hooks. They're no joke, man. I mean, these are some nice hooks on these things. The first thing I look at on the bait is hooks, especially from snakehead fishing, because you can tell right away. If, if, I, if I can bend them hooks with my fingers, just flex them a little bit, I know this ain't the hook for me. And I can tell looking at these hardened hooks that, that these, are, these are some really nice baits. Gary, show them that, that other bait. We've got a couple baits here. He sent us four baits. and uh, Got a double, double spinner or a double paddle at the bottom or yep. two. And well, I mean, got a little bend in it, and the other ones. Look at the thickness ground. of them hooks, you know. I mean, them them yeah, hooks. I mean, show them people. Yeah, I mean, good gosh, that's a hell hand. of a hook Stick there. You know what I'm saying? Here, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Ow! Let's go take a bite. That's nice. Under heavy hooks, they really are. Yeah. 
They look really nice, Brady. We're looking, we're, we're looking yep. forward to trying them out. So, uh, yeah, so if, if, if you think about it, reach out to Brady. Uh, I did want to tell you that we got the uh, the Savage gear, the hollow ducklings in, the 3Ds, and uh, the ones with the legs. It's almost, it's almost time for ducks. It's almost time for ducks. So, um, you know, you might want to get in and stock up on these while we got them out now before they're gone. Uh, this is one of my favorite baits, and I know several guys here that fish here that love this bait too. Uh, one of the coolest things about these baits is when the legs, the way they just kind of paddle across the top when you're reeling them. What do they do? They just paddle across the top when you do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the coolest thing dog. about them is when it's – when a fish hits them. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and don't, don't, don't forget, you know, you got Daryl Willie, his addiction baits, you know. We've got a lot of that stuff. We've got some stuff coming in here. You got order with him yet, Eddie? What's going on with that? We've got some oh, stuff yeah. coming down here. Yeah, it's okay. coming. And uh, don't forget about Old School Tackle Company. This is going to be a lure to reckon this year, I'm telling you. I mean, this uh, the color of these things is just amazing. Can't really. the, the video doesn't do it justice. You got to see it in person. And the hooks, the hooks are really nice. But like we said, we're going to test this wire out here on this spinner and see if that holds up. Uh, but I'm really anxious to try these out. These these swim baits that old, that the old school tackles making, uh, they They're are beautiful. very very nice. And then uh, we just finished stocking up a bunch of meps. Still got more coming. So yeah, we still got more coming. But uh, get down there and we got the meps in. Um, somebody was asking me earlier today what 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 is literally my two favorite color patterns to use. And for me, fire I like tiger. I like bright stuff. You know, one of my fire favorites tiger. is Fire Tiger. You know, I like that. And then my second favorite, everybody laughs, is my hot pink. And I'll tell you what. They're not laughing at the lower. They're laughing at you. I know. But this, <laughs> this, this, this thing catches a lot <laughs> of These little things here are cool. They've got a pretty good pattern. I don't know if you can see it on there. Yeah, it is neat. I, I would call this one Mad Mouse. <laughs> Mad Mouse. <laughs> got a pretty he looks pretty angry, doesn't he? Though, he looks pretty yeah. angry there. That one, so the pink one, looks like a hog head. Uh, it looked like it looked. Kind of, this one kind of looked like I don't know, like a, like kind of, like a serpent. Yeah, I mean, like it looks like one of those marshmallows head. Kaz was talking yeah, that's about. That's right. The pink <laughs> marshmallows. I forgot all about right. that. <laughs> oh my gosh! And don't forget, a swim bait can be your best friend this time of the year, and so can a uh, twister tail, and so can we just got a big stock of these. Yep. These are called elastics, okay? Hyper elastics. Hyper elastics. They got a blade on the back that spins when you reel. This is my cousin Ricky's new favorite bait that's all used last year, pretty much. And let me just tell you what. This is what we like about them. You see a snake head can pull, pull, pull. Look, I mean, I'm pulling this thing, man. It ain't going nowhere, you know? If you want a piece of plastic going to hold up, there it is right there. I'm telling you that right now. And don't forget, you got my good friend Chuang out there, SS Customs. Look, man, you want some buzz baits? You it's tell getting you what, time, folks. Yeah, you better stock these up. Buzz baits, buzz baits. These buzz baits here are incredible. My friend Brett Clayton, I remember we were field testing these things, his third cast. Got a giant snake head on one, a, a northern snake head, not a giant, but a, a big northern snake head on one of these buzz baits. Um, I think that's all I got on Tackle 10, Snakehead 101. If anybody wants to reach out to Brady Phelps, please do that. Um, I'm going to reach out to him and see what we can do about getting these in the store down here so that we can get these out down here and get a bunch of them in the work so we can get some reports back for him. Um, what else? And that's Snakehead 101. And that's Snakehead 101. Anything else? You guys got anything to add to it? That's it. When, when's the snow going to melt so I can catch a snakehead? Oh, well, we go yesterday. Yesterday. <laughs> well, look, look Dave, if you if you want to um if you just want to come on down here and go bluegill fishing, we can make sure we can do that for sure. We can That'll definitely we can definitely do that. Yeah. I'll tell you what, our last trip over there, dude. I don't know what happened to them things since last year, but I'll tell you right now. God dang! I mean, some of them suckers that we had a couple weeks ago, Gary. I mean, I ain't kidding you. They were two inches yeah. thick, man. I mean, that was they called man. him slash. <laughs> <laughs> called it a dinner I'll plate. Yeah. All that tender loving care, that Gary. Yeah. Gave. Oh, so, I my, saw. my wife feeds him every day, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I came out last week. Gary was laying on the bank with a straw blown air in the water. I said, "What's going on, man?" He said, "I came out here and checked the oxygen <laughs> levels were down, bro." Yeah. That's how dedicated he is, man. It's, you know what a, I mean? It's amazing. <laughs> you, you don't realize how much walking around uh, a waterway. Just on, on your ground, how much noise that you make. My wife, our deck is, or our house is about 75 feet from the pond. The deck is about 50 feet from the pond. And when my wife walks out on the deck in the morning, it's little ripples coming across the water. There's little, little Vs everywhere. Those, those fish can feel in that ground her walk across that deck. And know it's, it's breakfast coming. Before I forget, oh, anybody that's looking for a rep to come out, snakehead, Oh, look at that, Brady. Bit the first cast, man, huh? So, look, if you need a mount, a replica, uh, you can reach out to Barry Taylor, 717-577-7437. It's $20 an inch, six-month turnaround. So uh, get on the list if you've got a PB you want to get mounted up.
we'll get that taken care of too. Um, Dave, you got anything else for us before we sign off here today? No, sir. I'm gonna go cook dinner. What are you making? We might be over. I don't know. Good question. Maybe some, probably some deer. I, I, you know, I do have some deer in the freezer. So. We, could, we could bring cheese steaks. Great. We could bring cheese steaks, man. I'd rather have did beer. You get, did you get a second deer this year? Did you get? Oh second, no! Huh? When you when you come no. and get your boots, let me know, man. I'll hook you up a little bit. You're the man. I, I had a good year this year. You did have a good year. You did. So, uh, so just some forecasting here. We've got some really, really good guests coming up here in the next mm-hmm. couple of weeks. We've got Rob Fryer. He's going to be coming back in here to talk about his hunting season. Uh, we got some people from some really, really big companies that are going to be in here talking. Um, got some stuff talking with Woo Dave's right now. You know, I'm trying to get him in here on the podcast, trying to work something out there. Uh, Dave McMullen, you know, working some stuff out with him there. Um, the Wally Pog, we're going to bring him in and get him on the podcast too. Talk about the Wally Pog. That's going to be a new snakehead lure down here that you all haven't seen yet. Um, that's about all I got today, Eddie. I'm, you don't have any one mores? I mean, I pretty much think I covered it all for once in my life. It is February, so. <laughs> you, know, <I'm, laughs> you know, I, I was really like today. I really wish the deer season was still in. Yeah, I know. You know it's it's we get the snows two years in a row with the snow that we've gotten after deer season. It kind of stinks. I think the coolest. But, uh, I'm I'm ready for April. I think the coolest thing here is I don't know. But I know I know you got a lot of geese here where you're at. Gary, but at night when I'm sleeping, man, I think the the best thing about right now is hearing the geese fly. You know, there's just so many and they're so loud that when they go over, it's like an alarm clock. You know what I'm saying? You know what I think the best thing about right now is? What? It's almost a springtime. Winter's okay. almost over. That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> March is kind of like, you know, it's just some of us couldn't deal with 11. They want, <laughs> not, they want an even number. <laughs> March doesn't give you a whole lot. Usually some bad weather and some cold days. Right. It, all, all March means is February's over with. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it means we're going to be confused till April gets here. Yeah. <laughs> so that's about all I got today, folks. I don't have anything else. Yep. Do you want to sing with me or what? No, that's all you. Okay. So uh, as far as the weekend goes, if anybody needs anything up there at the Merrill Line, please send me a message. We'll get you up what you need, and uh, I'll get on the road tomorrow. Oysters, soft crabs. Got soft crabs by the boxes. Um, let me know what you need, and we'll get you what you want. Scallops. Uh, don't be afraid to ask. So I'm going to leave you all with a little crabby jingle. My crabs, they have three first names. It's heavy, full, and fat. My crabs, they have a fourth name. Absolutely monster packed! So if you ask me where they're from, they're 100% guaranteed Maryland number ones. At the crab stand, here's a fact I know for sure you're coming back. Kapow! Kapow! Kapow!